Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Mapping in the Digital Liberal Arts, Models, Methods, and Futures. Uh, today's webinar is part of Amical's online events. It's a series of events organized throughout the year on the initiative of Amical's standing committees. And more details about um, the event and about our committees are in the, available on the website um, and on Amical Connect. Today, we have invited David Risley to address questions like how and why you might use digital mapping projects in teaching and research in the humanities. I'm just gonna stop and make sure that my, uh, my video and my mic are working. I think they are. Um, so uh, David Risley, our invited speaker, he's currently uh, the associate professor, he's associate professor of digital humanities at New York University Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Previously, he was associate professor in the Department of English at the American University of Beirut, where he served for a time as chairperson of AUB's Department of English. And while he was at AUB, uh, David led numerous initiatives in the digital humanities for both AUB and for Amical as a consortium. And just to cite a few examples of that, he inaugurated and organized several times the Digital Humanities Institute of Beirut, in which many Amical members uh, have participated in the past. Uh, and he was the first chair of Amical's Digital Scholarship Committee, lending his guidance to Amical's own initiatives in the digital humanities. David, in fact, sparked the original idea to organize a cohort of Amical members to send it together uh, to the Digital Humanities Summer Institute. And this webinar was, in fact, organized in part to support that cohort of Amical members going to DHSI and to, to, to help uh, support their work on their projects. Uh, in particular projects that are focused on mapping. And so today's event is therefore going to have two parts. The first hour is open to anyone that's interested. Um, David will uh, give his presentation and then towards the end of the hour, open the, open the floor up to Q&A. Uh, then we'll close um, this Zoom meeting. And um, during the second hour, there will be a closed meeting that's reserved just for members of the Amical cohort that's going to DHSI for consultation with David on their mapping projects. And there's a separate link to that meeting um, that has been sent to the cohort members for that closed meeting. So um, if you're part of the cohort, you want and you are interested in participating in that consultation meeting afterwards, um, if you didn't get that link or you lost it, um, just send a quick uh, email or message to, 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 to me or Alex. And with that, I'll hand it to David to start the webinar. Okay, so I think I am I unmuted. Are people hearing me? Raise your hand if you hear me. Just so I see some faces. Great, awesome. So good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. I'm here in steamy Abu Dhabi. It's um, pushing thirty something today. Summer has arrived. I know that some of you are still in the middle of your springs, or maybe even something that seems less like spring. Um, it's really great to be back. Um, hi, everybody from Amical that I remember, and I see I'm looking at the participant list, and there are a lot of names that I don't know. So, hi to you too. I'm looking forward at some point um, to meeting you and maybe collaborating with you. I um, just to let you know, uh, I originally wasn't sure if I was going to be at DHSI this year in Victoria, and I actually will be there the second week. So, anybody who is thinking about that, um, uh, or has already signed up for it, I'll look forward to meeting you there. Please come up and introduce yourself. So what I'm gonna to do today um, is I'm gonna share a screen um, so that I can actually move to um, my uh, slides today. But I have to find those, give me one second. And um, my talk is, uh, it's about, uh, there's about 20 some slides. Um, and the, as, as, Jeff mentioned the, the my talk uh, is entitled Mapping in the Digital Liberal Arts, Models, Methods, and Futures. Now, everything that I'm going to show you today and talk about is not specific to the liberal arts. Um, many of the projects actually were gestated outside of liberal arts environments. But one of the things I'm going to try to do today is to focus on how one might adapt or what are the points of interest right that allow us um, to think about the kinds of interactions and the kinds of teaching and the kinds of undergraduate research right that we might um, do with our students that could lead to such projects 
The other thing I want to say before I start is that I'm actually not going to be talking about mapping technologies per se, right? I'm not going to actually be showing you how to do something. Um, that takes much more time. My, the purpose of my talk today is, is almost as a teaser, right? As a, a making you interested, right, in the possibilities and some of the promises, but also some of the challenges of engaging with um, mapping technologies. Okay. So uh, overview of today's webinar, um, as my subtitle said, I'm going to be speaking about models, um, some models of different kinds of uh, mapping projects, some methods, um, so that is some skills and some of the things that you might need to know how to do uh, to make maps. And then I have my last section called futures in which I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think the world of digital mapping might be changing. And there, it's really very, very open, um, but hopefully this will spark some discussion about um, what we might be doing 10 years from now. So my abstract, I'm just going to read it. It was on the, um, it was on the, uh, along with the uh, advertisement for the webinar. But we're going to look at some of the ways that making digital maps can enrich research and pedagogy, pedagogy in a liberal arts context. Look at some examples of digital projects organized largely around spatial dimensions of society and culture, as well as others that use maps in one of the many ways that their subjects can be better understood. We will look at what makes a strong mapping project from a dual perspective, both the data that underlies them and as well as their visual expression. Finally, we're going to discuss some of the basic skills for collecting and organizing spatial data and the challenges we face as mapping projects grow. So um, on the bottom of the slide, you can see uh, my Twitter handle, by the way, um, DJ Risley, if you'd like to um, mention me in a tweet or reach out to me on Twitter. So first section uh, is called models. So why mapping? Well, by mapping here, I just would like to say before we go any further that what I really mean is digital mapping. I mean using computers and using computer assisted means of doing mapping. We find a lot of uh, information, um, a lot of monographs in our field, a lot of um, places where people talk about mapping and they talk about mapping as a very abstract concept. I'm actually talking about the operationalizing of geospatial technologies to create visual maps. So I think that one of the reasons that mapping is interesting um, in the digital liberal arts is that it's subject agnostic. And what I mean by that is that it's not just geographers, right, or even social or economic historians who are doing maps or making maps anymore, but really it can reach out to lots of different fields. I like using mapping and I encourage people around me to supplement somehow their work that they're already doing with the capability that maps provide to stress the real world situatedness of a topic and to actually deal with the local complexity of any particular topic, right? So the words that you notice that I'm using here are ones that are actually about real places. Now there's a whole conversation that exists out there about mapping and thinking about mapping non-real spaces. Um, and that's a different conversation that I think we can have in a different environment. The fourth thing that I'd like, or the, rather the third thing in my list that I'd like to bring up is that mapping is a longitudinal act. And so quoting from Presner and others talk in their Hypercities book, they talk about mapping not being a one-time thing. Right? So it's not that we just make a map and we stop. Or as we used to in print culture, go to the library and open up a map, which has been sort of immortalized right? As in one form. Map is a, mapping is a long process. It's a process that we continue to add to and we continue to come up with new ways of visualizing. So it's a way that research unfolds in the, uh, it's, or it's rather a, it's a technology that accompanies um, a research project as it unfolds. Next, I think that mapping is really important when it's intentional and it's critical. And this is a way in which actually my work has begun to um, shift 
uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, I'm interested in the fact because, of course, mapping technologies have always been related to, um, or they rather were born out of uh, military um, technologies, right? And I think we see more and more with things like the Cambridge Analytica group and the leaks that took place in Facebook that we are being mapped, right, in some way. The information about the IP addresses that we use or information about the locations in which we're actually found, um, that our phones are geolocating, those are producing a map about us. And so I think one of the things which is interesting about actually using mapping technology in the classroom or in your research is that you have to, first of all, be aware of those things, be aware of the, of the technologies that underlie the processes of, that we're working with, but also one can then rise above those, right? Or assert in a very critical means something else besides that mapping of us. Finally, why mapping? I say that it's a very data-centered act. I think that mapping that I have done in the classroom has really been excellent for teaching both myself uh, and my colleagues, but also my students, data literacy and manipulation skills. So those things are my kind of, that's my beginning point today. Um, some of the reasons why you might want to think about mapping, begin to actively produce maps um, that are um, about the topics that uh, interest you. And I think that it's far from being just a kind of quantitative and or, um, uh, let's say, sort of technical process. I think it's actually, mapping is a very fascinating intellectual act. So what I'd like to do here um, is just uh, before I, uh, before I uh, continue on any further, I just want to make sure that everybody has been hearing me. Can I just see a hand, raise the hands? You're hearing me and you're seeing my slides. Great, awesome. So, because sometimes when you're giving a presentation, you're just talking into the void and you have no idea if the connection is cut or if anything else um, is going wrong. All right, so let's go back to um, uh, sharing my, uh, my screen. And I'm going to, now I should see, you should see my slides again. Hand up if you see my slides again. No, not yet. Slides again. Okay, I'm seeing my slides, so I'm assuming that's what everybody else is seeing. So um, now I'd like to ask the question, why mapping for the international liberal arts model? Now, you see that I put international inside of parentheses here. I think that something about our liberal arts model, right, is global. Um, but the, the audience that I'm actually targeting here, because I know this is web, uh, webinar is being recorded, is specifically the kinds of institutions that belong to the Amical Consortium. So we see actually there's a nice little map that the Amical Consortium has made, right, of those institutions on the right-hand part of the slide. One of the things that's interesting about those particular institutions is they are very different sometimes from the sister institutions of the same place, right? So they have a particular close relationship to locality or to place, right? They have a particular relationship to even to a set of people who have actually been sort of maintaining and, and, and been the stewards, right, of those institutions in those places. So because liberal arts colleges in general are very place-centered, I think that mapping allows us to think about experiential learning, right? It allows us to take research into the place in which we are and to explore something about that. Next, I would say that the liberal arts model, there's been a lot of talk about bringing primary sources into the classroom and maps and mapping, as we're gonna talk about a little bit later, sometimes rely upon historical artifacts. They definitely uh, rely upon texts sometimes, sometimes on archives, sometimes on the metadata that we have about objects in our archive. And so the act of mapping I believe helps us bring those, bring in another way, not just through, let's say, uh, content management systems or mecha exhibits or that, plus to bring primary sources into the classroom where we are analyzing, manipulating, and drawing information from those. 
The third reason I think that the liberal arts model, um, because we're very interested in liberal arts institutions and different learning styles that maps as, that have a very visual output are very interesting as a complementary um, form of pedagogy. Um, they require students to read. They were actually require students to read very closely sometimes, right, to create them. But then the outputs are not simply prose writing outputs. And I think that this is not only just part of the zeitgeist of the 20, of the, of our century, right, but also very, very useful for the generation um, that we're teaching right now. Since that Amical consortium is spread around Europe, Africa, and the MENA and South, and South Asia, um, even to Central Asia, right? I guess we'd have to say Manasaka, right? I guess for to get all of those people in. Um, we, we act very often in our institutions in some kind of role of cultural ambassadorship. And what I mean by that is that because we operate in English, because we have this kind of connectivity to other parts of the world via North America or via consortium, like Amical that represent those institutions, we have this capacity to speak for the place that we're actually in. And I think that maps, but also digital humanities projects in general, because they sit in a screen-based way, very often disseminating the results on the internet, have a particular voice to them, which is very important. And finally, for the liberal arts model, I think that many countries in particular in the wake, even before the, the Facebook leaks, some of the countries in Western Europe, let's say, certainly in North America, have thought a lot about privacy in the 21st century and what that means. And because we're carrying devices, and especially our students who live in a very device-centered world, they, they're not always aware of the fact that they're actually creating maps all the time. And what I mean by that is that their phones and their devices that are geolocating all the time are leaving traces of data all over the place that allow certain like geo profiles, right, to be created about them. So I think thinking about mapping intentionally and directly for a research project um, opens up a kind of a window for a critical discussion, for a critical pedagogy that is very, very relevant in the 21st century. So this is the part of the, pro of, of the seminar where I'm actually gonna talk, the webinar that I'm gonna talk a little bit about some projects. Um, again, these projects are not necessarily emerging from liberal arts environments, but I think they show some, one of the ways, one of those points that I made about very local knowledges um, being represented by maps and on maps. So this is a project called Going to the Show that was put together by historians and geographers in North Carolina, at the University of North Carolina. And by the way, whenever I have one of these, um, uh, one of these uh, screenshots, the screenshot is, should be accompanied on the right-hand side or on the left-hand side by a web link um, that will actually lead you to the project in case you'd like to go learn a little, a little bit more about it later. So this going to the show is about movies and about actually more specifically about movie theaters and where movie theaters are actually located within cities in North Carolina over time. Now, what's really interesting, I mean, I just picked this one particular city, the city of Albemarle in the eastern part of North Carolina, but one sees already, right, in the interface where we have the map in the center, which we recognize as being a Google, a Google map base, we have all kinds of other things, other ways in which that map is um, connected to other ways of seeing and viewing, even filtering data, right? What's really going on here is we have a small database of particular movie theaters historically. Those are connected to time. We have a, we have a marker of time. And then we have some other things about them um, that we get to do as a user. This is a, a map that invites us to interact with it. You can see along the left-hand side, right, there are these little check boxes that allow certain things to, um, to uh, be checked, turned on and off. In particular, we have active and inactive movie theaters, right? Like somehow there was an important, it seemed important to the project creators to talk about movie theaters that had died, 
We happen to have done a very similar kind of project at the American University of Beirut in a senior seminar that I gave where we were talking about bookstores, right? And it was a similar kind of a thing. We're thinking about bookstores, and in the particular case of Beirut, bookstores and gentrification and how print culture is changing in space over time. Now, the other thing which is interesting and important, which I'll just mention in passing here, is that you notice that there's both a Google satellite view and then there are some other kind of beige colored um, map tiles that are or maps that are underneath um, these blue tickets. And these are actually an interesting thing when we have um, certain cultures of the world where we happen to have had very robust mapping cultures. We happen to have a lot of information already mapped. Um, and so these actually turn out to be fire insurance maps that were created in the United States, which underlie, sit, literally sit underneath the data of a lot of materials, a lot of uh, spatial humanities projects having to do with the United States. Those happen to be digitized. They're really good windows into the past, right? I mean, a particular window into the past of commercial spaces, in particular the sort that would be um, insured. They're not open windows to everything about the past, but they do tell us something and they're very useful for certain kinds of projects. Next project that I'd like to bring um, up is called Placing Segregation, done at the University of Iowa. And this is really just a screenshot of the, um, of the, of the landing page of that project. And what's interesting here is we have a number of United States cities and those cities are looked at um, from the perspective of race. And I think one of the really, really interesting um, new uh, fields, right, in critical race studies nowadays has to do with the spatialization of race, of, of segregation, right? And so this one, this project has lots of possibilities and lots of ways that it could expand, right, to, to encompass uh, large teams of researchers, who are interested in different aspects of uh, social and economic and cultural history of American cities. Um, it's a project that I would invite you to explore. It's really too complicated to do justice to um, on just a slide, but it's an interesting case of a very specific spatial element of American society, which is being recuperated and um, not it's perhaps the wrong word, a, a space that's being um, uh, looked at again, right, uh, by uh, historians. The third project I, I just became aware of uh, a couple nights ago, um, a student, a former student of mine, who's now a Mary Curie fellow, went and using actually quite a simple um, platform, this is called uh, storymaps.js, created um, and was interested as a part of a postdoctoral project in looking at street art. And so in particular, he focuses here, this is just one of the slides of a spatial storytelling um, uh, site. And the, he picks one particular city and this has to do with Rome. And so I picked this slide because it just looked good. But what you see here, right, is you see this kind of the, the intervention of um, street poets, right, who stick poetry into the urban landscape, handwritten and then uh, sort of affixed um, to different surfaces around the city. And what this particular story does, this story map does, is it opens and unfolds a bit like one might do with, I guess, like almost sort of like a graphic novel or like a, I don't, I don't know, maybe like a blog or something. In other words, you have a mixture of texts and imaged, images, and then along the left-hand side here, um, one sees actually the locations of those things. This is an, a very recent project. Um, it's actually a project that interestingly has been remade across different platforms using the same data, right? I mean, one of the things that I hope becomes clear over the course of this very introductory seminar about mapping is that the kind of the underlying part of how all of these projects work is hard, the hard work right, of the collection and the curation of data. Then that data is then visualized in different manners, um, some of which are more appropriate for different kinds of projects and different kinds of problems, 
this project is actually a project that I ran in 2015, 2016 at the American University of Beirut. It's called Linguistic Landscapes of Beirut. And what you see here is a, a kind of a very, very kind of dramatic, if you like, um, image uh, coming from the south of the city of Beirut um, in Google Earth, where which we actually laid a portion of the data. But what the purpose of this project was, was to actually, again, use the fact that we were actually in the space of the city to our benefit and to learn something about um, multilingualism. And if you, anyone here is from Beirut, yay, yay, or anybody in here, uh, from Amical who has been to an event in Beirut, you'll know that when you walk through the streets of Beirut, there's an enormous amount of multilingual, but also multi-script expression in public written language. And so what we were doing here is we were collecting the information students and instructors, collecting in the streets as we moved around. And so this actually leveraged the possibility of smartphones and what, how smartphones geolocate as a way of intentionally mapping our landscape, taking stock of some of the aspects of our landscape that are the most interesting to us, and which incidentally have never been thought about in such a data-like manner. One of the things that's important to me being a digital humanist living in the Middle East is that I think we actually believe, we, when we begin to create data from the inside of our societies, that interestingly we get to overturn or rather supplant to change perhaps the opinion of people who have only heard stories about our societies on the outside or from people written on the outside. And so what this project has really done is really shown some fantastically interesting patterns of not just single languages, but rather patterns in script, and in particular, pairs of two languages together. In other words, the Lebanese in their space tend to use different pairs, and then they tend to use one or the other script in a way which is somehow location or site specific. You can check that out. This was also, this project was also featured um, by the Atlantic Monthly a couple months ago. So you can look for um, uh, linguistic landscapes of Beirut at City Lab and find that article. Finally, I think this is finally, I'm just saying, no, not finally, um, almost finally, is <laughs> um, a new project that I'm working on um, here at NYU in Abu Dhabi with some colleagues. And this brings together some colleagues um, from history, uh, digital humanities, myself, um, from Gulf studies and from legal studies and we're calling that project, well, I, I've called the slide here, Mapping Colonial Knowledge. And that sort of gets at the opposite side of what the previous slide showed. So if, if the linguistic landscapes of Beirut was about mapping from the inside, right? This is actually about mapping sources that were created um, by the British Indian government about the region in which we live. And so what we've done is we've worked on extracting um, place names that are mentioned uh, across these large sources and then mapping them and thinking about them in relationship to other forms of mapping of other issues having to do with colonialism. And so this one's an interesting one about, um, about it. it's a compendium um, that's about this part of the world. Um, one of the things that I've started doing, which I'll talk about a little bit later as we're finishing up, is thinking about how the data that underlies the maps in my projects can actually be shared and made available to other people. So I think one of the issues when we're working with maps is that we don't necessarily think about what's sitting underneath it. Rather, we think about it as a visual object. And for me, both pieces are actually important, right? The map, the data that's sitting in this particular map, which, are, which, are, um, which gave rise to my particular way of thinking about the data is not the end of that data, right? That data can be used and understood and thought about and critiqued by lots of other people. But knowing how, first of all, to cre create that data, and then second of all, to share that data with other people, those are two very different skills. So I'm moving away now from, uh, and I have a couple less slides that are actually about live data. Everything that I've shown before is about data that was sort of painstakingly curated by people 
either in an environment or working with materials, let's say coming from archives. This part, I'd like to just mention that there's a, we have a very interesting um, new kind of, well, not so new, but uh, a, 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 a new frontier, if you like, and this sort of points to our question of futures later in the seminar, the webinar, um, is about live data. And so this is mapd.com. And what we see here is we see sort of live maps that are generated on the fly based on hashtags, right? So if you think, and this is particular drawing upon Twitter data, one, one of the things that you see that's very interesting in the map on the left-hand side, right, is the way that languages that are automatically associated with tweeting, um, algorithmically associated with tweeting, are colored, right? So we see the light blue, baby blue of the UK, of the United States, we see it in South Africa, we see it in certain parts of, of Asia, and then we see other languages like the red of Portuguese, right, or the green, the light green of Spanish. But what gets really interesting to me about these kinds of maps, right, and this goes back to this question about language dominance versus multilingualism, I think that we, many of the, are of the Amical schools, Amical liberal arts environments are embedded in multilingual situations. And if you look at something like uh, Central Asia on this map, or even if you look at Eastern Europe or at India, right, one sees how many languages people are actually producing on the fly, right, producing in real time. And these make that. Now, what's interesting, if we then turn to the right-hand side, um, where I've specifically uh, isolated Arabic, right, what we get, this purple, which might be a bit hard to see on the slide, um, is that Arabic is not a language which is uh, limited to the Arabic speaking world, but rather, right, it's actually all over the place. And in particular, there's lots of people tweeting, um, not only on the Raven Peninsula, where I'm sitting right now speaking to you from, but also in Germany and in Eastern Europe, in the Americas, in other diasporic locations. So this kind of mapping is, is I mean, they're, it's basically the same idea as what we saw before, but the data is coming from a different place. Another example of that um, is uh, RC map, um, which actually looks at, it's called recent changes map. This draws upon data which is um, generated when people change Wikipedia entries. And so when you open it up, what I happen to have done here is actually visualize um, Arabic and English and French and Japanese and Spanish and Russian and Hindi together. But if you wanted to, you could also do Polynesian and Malayalam and you know, Farsi and whatever languages you want. And what one gets here is a kind of a live stream of changes. And then those changes show up on the map. Now, of course, this is not perfect. One can't see all of them. There are some issues because there are many people who are actually uh, editing Wikipedia uh, anonymously. And so when you're going anonymously, we have to go by IP address and IP addresses don't always locate perfectly into the world where someone is actually doing the work. But the point is that we get some kind of a general picture about how Wikipedia um, is changing. And in both of these cases, the previous one about live social, the sort of live social geodata, and the second one about Wikipedia, what we learn yet again is that the world is not a place where any, maybe it never was, but it certainly isn't anymore, where languages map cleanly onto geographies. So coming from the perspective of someone like myself, fascinated by new media, fascinated by histories of languages, but also uh, interfaces of languages, places where languages bump up against each other and mutually change each other, right, or, and coexist, but also mix with each other. These are fascinating projects for me. Um, now, what you would do with a project like this, or how you would use a project like this, I think ultimately depends on the kind of interest that you have, the kind of teaching that you do. So all of those projects that, I, that we've seen so far, they go, um, they're, they're very useful, right? Like you can, they're actually acts of scholarship in a way, right? They're, they're showing us something about our topics or topics of interest to us and space or place, location that we haven't been able to do before, 
Now, what's interesting is, I think, is to what extent we like to see ourselves as passive consumers of such projects, because of course, all of those could be used in our classes. I have lists and lists and lists of many, many different projects like this that I use when I teach mapping and I teach the spatial humanities. And, or rather, the extent to which we actually want to be active producers of such maps, right? We want to actually step in and make those maps come about in the environments in which we are working and on the topics which we care about. So just to finish with this little section, this is an alternative visualization. This is actually created by a robot, right? Or like a robot editor in Wikipedia. These are all of the, the edits taking place in Wikipedia at a given time. They can also become extremely complicated, right? So data is not just clean and doesn't just show up on a map perfectly. It actually has to be tamed in some way. It has to be curated and it has to be um, worked on, right? So that a map tells you a story that you want, to, uh, tells, tells a story that you want it to tell. So the second section, uh, and the, these uh, two other sections are gonna be significantly smaller um, in length, shorter in length. This so one's called, well, I called it methods. Now, what do we mean by methods? Well, I'm, I'm going back now from, we talk, we ask the question why one does mapping um, to begin with, and then why we do it in international liberal arts environments. And then we looked at some, maybe the what do maps look like? Um, we saw some examples of those. But how do we actually make those maps? Like how do we actually, and I say here, build a map. Now that might be a weird mixed metaphor that's, 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 that's not well placed here, but maps are actually constructed, right? They have lots of pieces to them. So in the courses that I teach on mapping, um, one of the things that people really want to do very often is build maps from texts. So what kinds of things are available to us if we actually want to work from texts? Well, we can extract manually, or even if we know a little bit more about programming, we can extract place names from texts, right? These are, this is a process called na um, named entity recognition. And so if we get good at it, we can actually, we can do it as a, as a reader, we can create a pattern for how we might want to do it, and we can begin to extract. So some people, um, I see uh, that Kristen Highland is on the, uh, on the call, right, has done work really interesting work about extracting addresses, right, from catalogs. A really interesting project, right, on the Lebanese diaspora in the United States based on old business directories. It's a trick, it's, it's hard, right? It's, it's, again, as I say, painstaking work, but one can begin to learn how to pull out geographic information from texts and then put them on maps. Of course, then what you wanna think about as you're doing that is, well, what other kinds of information do we want to associate with those places? Do we want to associate with language or with other metadata? And that's, that's the art of building maps from texts. I think the other thing that we can do, uh, and this goes back to speaking about the going to the show project about cinema in North Carolina at the beginning of the webinar, we can actually build maps out of other historical maps or out of other maps, right? So there's a process that we can learn about how we can take an analog map, like a map that was meant to exist on paper, and we can digitize that. And then with a digital version of it, we can kind of fit it to the grid of what other people have done. Now, this is interesting, of course, with atlases, with historical atlases. It's interesting with um, all kinds of material that include maps, um, perhaps maps that were not meant to be thought of as accurate cartography, but rather were more like topological representations of places. So we can turn to do that. That has another skill set associated with it, learning how to um, adapt the analog and bring it into the digital world so it can be manipulated. Now, the interesting thing about libraries, right, is that many libraries are starting to do this for us. And so we find, um, portals associated with map libraries where we have access to digital maps. Another place we can actually work to build maps is from other people's data, right? So um, in particular, when you meet a GIS librarian or you meet someone who's involved in GIS, geographic information systems, they very often will point you towards things like that, the e-government data. But again, e-government data works in certain parts of the world, 
it doesn't exist in other parts of the world. So the data landscape of the various institutions um, that we may all belong to who are on this call, or, um, the people who are on this call, those data landscapes are not the same, right? Now, so I think that different people inside the consortium are gonna to have to think differently about where they can actually take their data. The other thing that I'd like to make a claim, which is that we can make maps based on devices, right? We have lots of geolocating devices. We have, in particular, the smartphone is probably the most generalized and democratized of all of those. Even the most basic smartphone um, has the capacity to geolocate, and that means that we can use certain apps that allow us to leverage the geolocation possibilities of those apps to actually move through space and to record things. Now, these kinds of devices used to be very expensive and people like archeologists use them, right? And there are still people who have very, very precise ones. I think that for most of our purposes, for the kind of um, imprecise maps that people um, in the liberal arts tend to make, and I say imprecise um, between scare quotes, um, that the smartphone tends to be enough. So if you wanna do mapping, what do, you, what do you wanna know how to, what do you want to know how to do? Right? And this is just a slide that I called mapping and a few skills. I think the, one of the most important things for mapping, and this speaks to a lot of the digital, digital initiatives that Amical has been uh, spearheading, is we have to learn how to collaborate. Right? Like nobody actually has the full spectrum of all of the skills that are required from working with archives to modeling data to making the maps to making those maps available on the web, all that kind of stuff. Like collaboration is really key here. But some other skills that are interesting, and these are skills that one can find if you go to something like a digital humanities training opportunity, you can learn. You can learn data modeling. How do we structure our data? How do we create the tables, right? Like the, the, the background information in a way that the computer actually understands it. We have to learn how to manipulate data, some data skills, learning how to um, uh, change tables to join tables to bring all kinds of data together um, from different sources. What some people call data carpentry is really important. And then beyond that, there are also kinds of interesting things. Like if we think about the show, going to the show project, again, we wanna learn how to layer. Well, what are the layers that are significant for the kinds of questions that you have? What things do we want to put on top of each other inside of a map so that we can think about how much proximity there is between two phenomena or how much non-proximity there is between them. Semantics on a map, colors, this is also sometimes called not just visual semantics, it's also called symbology. What do they mean? Well, on the going to the show map, we had little tickets, right? Which is very cute for a map that has to do with the cinema. But if you can imagine when we get very complicated maps, we have to be sparing about the kinds of things we put on top because otherwise it becomes very hard to see. We have to learn something about image manipulation. There's a process called georeferencing that I mentioned, which is that actually that process of taking the analog map and making it digital. And then in some ways we have to just learn how to structure our data, right? Make data, put it, again, it's a bit like data modeling, but just put it in a format, right? That, that, that moves across platforms. It can be used in different places. So the last part that I'm talking about here is called futures. I'm gonna talk about two more minutes or so, and that includes some challenges. So one of the things which is interesting about geospatial work um, is has to do with the limited internet and the limited data that we have in many of the parts of the world where we're listening, perhaps, um, to this Amical webinar from. This actually, the I apologize, the uh, address for this actually got buried underneath the, uh, the image, but this is from the FOSS4G community. This is for open source, um, geospatial uh, information and you know one of the problems in the geospatial community is how much how many licenses you have or how to buy into those licenses there are lots and lots of ways of storing and visualizing your materials the easier they are sometimes the more expensive they are the more open they are sometimes the more difficult they are to use right um, one of the things that I just wanted to bring attention to here is this is actually a conference which is going on in August in Dar es Salaam. And the idea here is geospatial work for a place like Africa. Like what would you need to deal with there? And the third part here is really interesting, right? Called widening access and humanitarian mapping. 
right, role of the crowd, humanitarian mapping, sustainable development, geospatial applications in low speed internet countries, and the role uh, and uh, how to cope the age of the cloud based geospatial technology. Right, we're headed into a, into a world where geospatial technologies have really advanced in certain parts of the world, but they also carry along older traditions and they're starting to insert themselves in other places. So different parts of the world have different challenges. And I think that that will uh, definitely um, translate into the capacity of different institutions to lever leverage that kind of technology. I think this is from my own project, Medieval.Place, right? This is actually about different ways of visualizing map data. Sometimes I, as I'm starting to learn, I think other people are, is that thinking about map data or thinking about spatial data doesn't always have to sit on the map, right? It can jump to a network, it can jump to a neural network, it can jump to like all kinds of advanced and interesting um, ways of thinking about data. But the, uh, the, to, I'm gonna finish with this slide. I think this is my finishing slide, my, my penultimate slide. Um, and that is that we don't actually know what the future of mapping platforms is going to look like. So the names that we might recognize now, like Cardo and Mapbox or Boundless, which is a relatively new kid on the block, or things like Voyant uh, that has a new uh, spatial um, um, visualizer in it, and then something like Omega, where one can build uh, digital exhibits with neat, the plug-in neat line, which I'll, we're not sure that these things are going to exist in five years or 10 years. So in some ways, one of the the kind of the data first movement which is coming to the digital humanities pretty um pretty robustly makes it really important that we create data that can be shared right the data that can be abstracted from its visual representation and put into a format that can then be reactivated in some kind of later visualization I think one of the things that we're going to be looking at very soon, if not what's emerging right now, are the appearance of open data portals of the sort we're talking about, sort of live data, government data, more data that's out there. And we're going to have to think about like the, not only the reliability of such portals, um, the kinds of ideologies that went into the creation of such portals, um, but also um, the kind of the possibilities of mixing that kind of data with other data that we create in academic environments. And finally, um, this is just referring to a, the image which is on the right hand side, which is an example of some Abu Dhabi buildings that one of my students built using SketchUp. And so this was actually an exercise in 3D. These were then located, they were geolocated. So this is what I'm going to finish with called geolocation isn't just for maps anymore. Um, is that lots of new technologies, including drones and 3D, are using the same kinds of elements that we saw in maps, but they're adding a they're adding this z-axis, right? And we're adding a new dimension to it. And so we're going to have to think about, I think, as we move into the future, about maps that actually leave the flatlands, right? As Edward Tufte says. So if you'd like to know more. Um, the Association of Digital Humanities Organizations has a Geo Humanities SIG. Um, that, that's very open and easy to find. Most places in the world have open street mapping groups, um, which could be interesting. I mean, call supports people to go to digital humanities training events like the Digital Humanities Institute in Beirut that I founded, or DHSI, which some of you are going to, or even ESU, the European Summer in, uh, University for Digital Humanities. You can check out, my, check out my own website, djrisley.com. There's a teaching tab. I've got a bunch of different courses that I've taught on the subject with a lot of materials there. But my encourage thing, my, 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 the thing that I would encourage you to do inside of your local, inside of your own institutions is to reach out to people in media, in geography and data science, because they're probably also thinking about mapping. You just don't know it. So finally, this I'll leave this slide up. This is actually the course that I'm teaching, and I believe that you probably could apply for a short-term uh, grant to go to, but this is the, the course called Humanities Data and Mapping Environments that I'm gonna be teaching this summer uh, for 10 days in Leipzig, Germany. And the idea here is not how just to create maps, but to think about how spatial frames of reference or a spatial dimension can actually enrich research projects and your pedagogy. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my slides um, and I'm gonna switch back to uh, Zoom and I'm hoping that everybody is still there. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks, David. So we've got 10 minutes for Q&A, if anyone wants to, to jump in with questions. Um, the, uh, while you're getting ready to ask questions, I'll just mention that the, uh, the one thing I did see um, asked in the, in the chat was about the, um, some of the links to projects that you mentioned um, from your, and that were uh, indicated in your slides, David. And I think if I understand right, um, we'll, uh, we'll get the slides from you afterwards. And is it OK if we make those available? Uh, Definitely. Definitely. No, the, shows, no. the slides will be shared and the links, I'll fix that one link, which is slightly hidden behind the image, and then anybody Great. can take the links later for their reference. Yeah. Great. So if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and just jump in. Or if you have problems using the uh, using audio, you can put your questions in the chat on the, on the right. And if you don't see the chat window, you should be able to open it up um, on the bottom right of the toolbar at the bottom of the uh, Zoom window. There's a, um, you may see something that says more uh, chat and then click on that and that should open up the chat window if you want to use that. I'm going to go ahead and just jump in with a question while we're waiting for others. Um, but please, I encourage you to just cut me off if you've got your own questions. Um, uh, it's sometimes hard to see who's sort of getting ready to, to ask a question on in these online meetings. Um, I want to ask a question, David, regarding the preservation of mapping data from the sort of class integrated project, projects that might be developed in the context of a, of a class. Um, as a faculty member, I'm, I'm thinking that you may have a different view from librarians or archivists, for example, about the, the need for the importance of conserving the data that comes out of those projects. Um, do you, but, uh, from your perspective, do you have recommendations of, about that, about um, um, ensuring the, the, the longevity or the, the preservation of, of mapping data? And relatedly, what kind of opportunities do you see for I guess the, the reuse of that kind of data that's, that comes out of a, a class-based project, um, either the, the reuse of the data or the visualization of the uh, and interfaces that are, that are produced for those. And I guess that's sort of, you mentioned something related to the data first movement, so you sort of answered part of that, but if, if you have anything else you want to add to that, that'd be interesting. Right, great question, thanks. So I think one of the problems, right, obviously is that the data that we produce, particularly in something like, if you take, for example, the linguistic landscapes of Beirut project, right, we were creating data using a third party um, service, right, it was not an open, fully open data. So when you're putting in materials into, some, into a third party um, uh, provider, um, so something, even if you're working with something like, you know, even an ArcGIS or one of the commercialized, because many of the things in, in the geospatial industry that are easy to use are commercialized, right? So um, if you're using those, you don't want to let your, your data sit out there um, in a startup's app, right? You know, even in, the, in a cloud service, because you actually don't know when that's going to shut down, right? And so we've seen actually in the last year, two years, lots of flux and lots of change as the geospatial um, technologies industry has really has, has, has migrated to other models, right? Let's put it that way. So the, I think actually, I mean, again, take the linguistic landscapes of Beirut project. What we've done is we've made sure that we capture um, and we make a full download of all the data. It's actually stored. We're hoping um, that the image data from that might be stored in an institutional repository. But we're actually working on kind of another step of the data, and we're just working on it in the open in GitHub, right? So uh, GitHub, which is a, a versioning platform that most people use if you're like a programmer to share and, move, and to, to have data that's sort of out there in the world that other people can, can build upon, particularly code, right? Not data of the sort that we're talking about. But digital humanists are increasingly using GitHub as a place to park their data, to make their data available to other people and usable. So I don't know if Amical necessarily needs to reproduce those systems, like right, by creating their own sort of repositories. I think there are certainly some things out there. One thing that my home institution has is it has what's called geo, a geo blacklight instance, which is 
it basically has a repository for spatial data. And if you have a repository for spatial data, it allows for different kinds of formats, allows for vectors and polygons and point-based data and, and georeference maps and all the things that are sort of important to a spatial humanist to all sit together. I'm not sure that that's something that everybody in the world is going to migrate to, right? Like not everybody's gonna have that. But I certainly think that of the fledgling projects that might come about in the spatial humanities, where basically what you're talking about in, in Amical, we were basically what you're talking about is structured tabular data, put it in GitHub, create an Amical GitHub site for the data sets that Amical is working on. It's not, I mean, we, we're not sure that GitHub will last forever, right? But it's certainly gonna last longer, right, than say commercial, uh, you know, commercial hostings, which we don't know what will happen to. That's my suggestion. Great, okay, thanks. Other questions? And by the way, I'm open to completely baseline questions. I know I sound like a like a digital humanities nerd, but I'm but like can be anything like completely simple, uh, what you think is maybe not even relevant in this environment. So please do not be shy. Okay, I, I have a feeling this, this actually goes back to, to Jeff's question, at least a little bit, um, surrounding sort of the idea of privacy and data and the ways in which you create, you, you talk about shareable data across different places. Is there first off a, a type of data set that you think would allow for that data to be more easily. I'm working in archaeology. I've worked on numerous different kinds of databases that have been created. Everybody has their own idea of what a database should look like, which can make it very hard to share data across different communities. And so is there something that you're seeing emerging as, yeah, this is, this is really, you can do your own thing over here, but you, you got to have this stuff to make it immediately accessible across communities. And then what do you do in terms of privacy, both in terms of the data set, but also in terms of the, the types of projects that you create off of that with um, how you deal with student privacy amongst other things. This is something if, if you're working with students that the students have created, can that go out there in, that wor in the world? Are you working with material that maybe isn't fully or shouldn't fully be accessible? How do you, what kinds of things do, I mean, and as I said, this sort of focuses on Jeff's question a little bit, but in my archeological mind where a lot of things are shut down, <laughs> I, I can't help but think of that a little bit. No, those are great questions. Those are not, those are great questions. They're fabulous questions. Thank you for that. Um, the, let me ask, let me start with the privacy question first and then move back to the other one. I think that one of the things obviously, which is very interesting, right, but also very problematic about the, the concept of geolocation, right, this kind of, this device, that we have in our pocket, which is constantly sending a signal, right? Is that somebody's collecting data about you right now and not sharing it with you. And, and I mean, if you read down and dug, dug down into the terms and conditions, you would recognize that that's actually happening. So first of all, I think that to go back to that question about opening a critical discussion about privacy, I think that working with data definitely opens up that, right? It definitely opens up and kind of makes people more aware of that fact makes people more aware of the fact that when they tweet into the universe you know it sort of sticks out there or somebody's like using that to model and you know something about them right trying to come up with a of an idea of who they are so privacy i think when you make a project especially a project which is course embedded that one has to be very careful right that the topics are not revealing something right about the people involved so our idea of street language in beirut right the linguistic landscapes project we thought well that stuff is sitting there anyway right so it's just sitting out in plain view and so um our pr basic one of the basic principles there is no people in the images right and then even more interestingly or perhaps more abstract right is the fact that a data set which is created by 50 people over a year contains like a name identifier, right? So in the whatever version of this, which is actually published, we have to make sure that that is scrubbed away from the information because otherwise, if you make a map and you actually just say, show me the map by the people, 
one can actually just sort of see the neighborhoods where people were walking around, right? In other words, we see exactly that idea of an identity, like a geo identity profile, which has been created about us, right? But we just see it in the day that we've actually created. So privacy, I think, totally important, super important about. But I think that for me, that data about Beirut's languages should be shared with people, right? I actually don't think about, so for me, privacy is not a question of like my own private data set that I don't want other people to have, right? I have those, right? I have those. But there are other data sets that we can create and we can create in communities that are actually empowering to communities, that provoke new questions for communities, right? That don't, I don't think, actually pose serious problems for people, the people who created them, right? So there's an ethics, if you want, a lot of talk now about data ethics, right? There's an ethics that goes into designing the project and what the project is going to say. Now, um, on the question about like the data, like the data modeling, I think was the first part of the question, which is like what kind of database or what, it, I mean, the thing that I would encourage you to, the thing that I've been most inspired by right now is this thing, is the, the data first manifesto that I was actually talking about um, one of the most interesting things I've read in a long time, that just a lot of people who are working in digital humanities are saying that, well, you know what, we should actually make it really simple, right? You know, I mean, simplicity is not nuanced argument, right? Sim but simplicity and simplicity of format and simplicity of model does allow for data to move and be recombined and be rethought. So it's sort of this idea that, that, that that's maybe a good place to start. It's not, a nor it's not a natural place for us to start as an academic though, right? We think beginning with something which is very nuanced and very complex is the better way to begin. But I think that's more about like how we think about writing articles than creating data sets. That would be my, my response to that is, and this is, it takes some time. Like, I mean, I didn't turn into the, the, the DH dork that I am overnight, right? I mean, it, this is something that's been going on for 10 years of my life. So I have things that I've created that I don't think are as shareable or as perfect as others. Um, creating a data set is also a kind of a critical thinking exercise in which you, to be honest, don't always do it right. And that's okay. So thanks for the questions. Thank you. I'm not hearing you, Jeff. <laughs> okay, so I muted myself. So I was just saying that we're we're at the end of the, the hour for the for the open webinar. Um, and I was just gonna suggest that any of the um, cohort members, the amical cohort members that are going to THSI and who will be uh, staying around to rejoining um, the, the closed meeting afterwards for cons the consultation with David, if you have additional questions that you want to ask or follow up on what's just been discussed let's hold this off for the uh for the next hour um we're we're pretty much out of time for the, for the webinar itself so i want to thank david for um, a really interesting webinar there was some uh really interesting questions that he raised at the beginning related to how um, digital mapping projects fit into the, um, the liberal arts curriculum and there were some interesting things about how it relates to digital and data literacies which i was hoping to follow up with it in, uh, about but maybe i'll have another chance and in any case when we have our amical conference there's a discussion that we're open to uh, that i'll be hoping to, to tie that into at the conference next month as well um, so thank you david for a fascinating webinar and um, the cohort will rejoin with david in about five minutes uh, with the other media link so thanks everyone for, for joining us. Thanks, my pleasure. Bye-bye.